We'll start with the Irish Times this morning. Uh, most difficult rape trial ends in acquittal of all four accused. It's Conor Gallagher's story. He's got extensive coverage of the case inside the Irish Times this morning. We'll go through that in terms of details uh, over the next few moments. The front of the Irish Daily Star this morning says, cleared Jackson lawyer slams system, holding sorry for hurt to girl. Upset accuser has no regrets. Toxic social media is blasted. The front of the Irish Examiner, meanwhile, this morning says, rugby star status, reason for trial. Uh, that is a story by Leslie Ann McKeown. Police and prosecutors defend handling of the case amid criticism. That's the front page there. Uh, the Times Ireland edition, meanwhile, goes for the angle hunt for web users who outed rape trial woman. Prosecutors defend case as rugby stars cleared and lawyer attacks onslaught of toxic content. Uh, a couple of other front pages this morning. The Irish Daily Mail goes justice. A young woman grilled by four barristers over eight days. The disturbing sexual antics and bragging of sports stars laid bare. Accuser and accused vilified online after the most shocking rape trial of our time sees all four acquitted. Did any good come out of this unedifying process? That's the front of the Irish Daily Mail this morning. The Irish Independent, another picture of Paddy Jackson on the front. There are no winners here. Olding, sorry for hurt caused. Jackson, status drove prosecution. Complainant upset at verdicts. That's the uh, front of the Indo. The Irish Sun, it's over. Jackson, thanks for a fair trial. Olding, I'm sorry for hurt caused. Police, rape claim girl upset. That's a picture from the uh, night of the alleged incident um, on the front page there. And then the Irish Examiner sports section asking next step what now for acquitted Ulster and Ireland duo obviously there is going to be an investigation by the IRFU a committee has been put in place by the IRFU and also by the uh, which can be made up sorry of, of IRFU members and also uh, Ulster rugby there's the the text of the press release yesterday. A review committee made up of senior representatives of the RFU and Ulster Rugby has been appointed and will conclude its review as soon as practicable. The players will continue to be relieved of all duties while the review committee is in process and determining its findings. So what are we at? We're at the end of March. I guess there's a good chance that um, those contracts are allowed to run down and that the next time um, Stuart Olding and Paddy Jackson take the field that it will be somewhere outside of Ireland which would obviously uh, given current selection criteria, more than likely mean the end of their Ireland careers as well. So uh, strong speculation in many of the newspapers this morning that um, French and English clubs have been keeping an eye on Jackson and Olding. We would heard in the past that Exeter had been interested in uh, signing both players. They'd, they'd been linked with both players. Certainly that was the rumour mill doing the rounds amongst um, the rugby fraternity, but there's been no confirmation, obviously, of anything, and I suspect there won't be any confirmation for quite a while. Just a couple of other front pages this morning as well, just uh, two here. The Herald goes with not guilty on the front page of this morning's newspaper. And the last front page uh, when it comes to this story is vile trial. That's the front of the Irish Daily Mail. Lawyer blasts Twitter. That's an angle, as we've said, that a lot of the newspapers uh, are going with this morning. The newspapers, though, as I say, kind of giving an unbelievably comprehensive breakdown of this case that I guess was impossible to do on broadcast media over the last 24 hours. Yeah, so just some interesting stuff that um, uh, we've been trying to pick out bits and pieces of this that maybe was relatively new information or stuff that um, had come through. Nicola Anderson in the Irish Independent speaking about the judge um, amid a pressure cooker environment rare in its intensity. This would have been no easy trial for any judge. At the heart of it all was a vulnerable witness who was facing relentless questioning at the hands of no fewer than four legal teams on the behalf of the defence pushing things as far as they could be pushed under law. Um, obviously the attendance of Rory Best comes up and we'll get some more details on that in just a moment. But um, some more details from Nicola Anderson here about the judge. Um, as a junior counsel, she was part of the legal team representing the families in the Bloody Sunday inquiry. Softly spoken and at all times measured and courteous, she was nevertheless most determined in the running of this trial. It was clear that she would do everything in her power to avoid the possibility of a mistrial, even down to allowing the defence barristers to make several amendments and suggestions to her final direction to the jury. That was interesting because people were, um, you know, in her final direction to the jury, it definitely felt like there was a lot of the... Um, defence case present in it, down to and including the fact that um, the character witness for one of the men had actually got in touch um, to give that character witness uh, on spec as opposed to it having been solicited by the defence team. But it's just interesting that they had an influence over the closing remarks and I wonder if that's unusual, I don't, I don't know if that um, is fairly standard procedure or not. 
the Conor Gallagher article uh, today on page four and five of the Irish Times is pretty exceptional. It breaks down everything. There's a couple of bits I've picked out. Uh, one of the major themes uh, that's kind of come in discussion programs as a result as a result of this is the different jurisdictions here: the Republic of Ireland versus Northern Ireland. And I'm just going to read out some of Conor Gallagher's article from this morning. During eight days on the stand, uh, the complainant gave evidence from behind a curtain. She was able to see the judge, the jury and the lawyers, but the rest of the room was obscured. Everyone could see her, though. A camera in front of the box transmitted her evidence to a video screen placed in front of the dock and the public gallery. The woman is entitled to lifelong anonymity and there are severe penalties for publishing her name. However, in the UK, unlike the Republic of Ireland, the public is allowed into rape trials. It wasn't long before her name was widely known and shared on social media. The other element of that then, which I think kind of uh, people were chatting about during the case, was about the uh, defendants taking the stand. And I'm just going to read out this part as well. Uh, in the Republic, it's relatively rare for defendants to decide to give evidence in their own defence while taking the stand allows the accused an opportunity to give their version of events in their own words. That's obviously different uh, in the North. Um, the dynamic is different. Juries are told they can take an inference from a defendant's choice not to give evidence. And if they do take the stand, the jury is instructed that this supports their credibility. Hence, it is more common for defendants to give evidence in the North, which kind of clears things up uh, a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was definitely one of those moments where you're like, ooh, they're going to give evidence, but obviously it happens a bit more there. Was there one other bit? Yeah, so when it comes to them taking the stand... Uh, Toby Hedworth reserved his most ruthless cross-examination for McElroy and took his time grilling him about the major discrepancy. The barrister suggested the men had got together at a cafe the next day to circle the wagons and engage in a cover-up. By this stage, they knew the woman was alleging rape and they needed to get their stories straight, he said. Counsel said each man was assigned a fabricated story about their actions that night, but McElroy got mixed up when interviewed by police. He gave the account Olding was supposed to give. It became known as the circle the wagons theory. The accused rejected it, insisting the woman had performed consensual oral sex on him. It's, a, it's, it's an interesting account of the end of the trial as well. Uh, Gallagher writing here, just I guess about uh, the touchiness, you know, whatever, eight and a half, nine weeks, went on longer than people expected, as Frank was telling us in the programme yesterday. So I'll read out Conor Gallagher's uh, section of his article here once again. The lawyers and even the judge began to look as if they would rather be anywhere else and clashes over legal matters became more frequent. The jury was also showing signs of strain, appearing more tired and drawn than in earlier weeks. The trial was scheduled to last five weeks. By the time it reached week nine, two jurors had already fallen ill, with one, one recovering and one being excused permanently. Another juror had a cruise booked which they were forced to postpone at the urging of the court. As the judge prepared to send the jury to deliberate, the accused men looked similarly exhausted. Harrison, who earlier in the trial was spotted outside giving a solicitor the use of his umbrella during the inclement weather, clashed with a photographer as he was leaving court. The overrun was causing financial problems too. Olding had run out of money to pay his legal team about halfway through the trial and had to apply for legal aid, which Judge Smith agreed to grant. So there's bits like that which uh, hadn't exactly been to the forefront uh, of reporting uh, throughout the case. That there's a number of different things in this article and indeed throughout the print media. I should say as well that there are still reporting restrictions in place. Um, highly unusual move by the lawyer to, or the, by the judge rather, to prevent all of the legal argument that happened during the case to be reported on. So there are, what happens in cases like this, um, the barristers from on both sides will present legal arguments. The jury is removed from the uh, trial room while that's happening and the reporters can't report on what's happening. This is, tends to be quite important. It's like whether or not certain elements of um, evidence are inadmissible or stuff like that generally. Um, now, for whatever reason, at the end of uh, a case, Ordinarily, all of that can then be reported on by whoever is covering the case and has been covering the case from day one. So you would expect that Frank Graney and his colleagues would have had a load of extra information that would have come to the fore yesterday. That has not been the case. The judge has placed a reporting restriction uh, for a period of time, which will be removed, we believe, perhaps next month. Yes. Another passage, as you mentioned there, evidence uh, which wasn't actually brought to the case, but is allowed to be reported upon now uh, after the case. Uh, again, I'm, I'm reading Conor Gallagher's article here regarding the texts. In the group, this is the WhatsApp group, Jackson and Olding boasted about spit-roasting the woman. This word was a point of contention in the trial. The defence maintained spit-roasting could mean any sexual activity involving two men and a woman, while the prosecution suggested it very specifically means a woman penetrated orally and vaginally by two men at the same time. To prove this, 
the prosecution had hired an expert in slang language to write a report on the exact meaning of the word, although this was never presented in court. One other piece I'm going to read out is regarding social media and Rory Best. When Best turned up with Ulster teammates Ian Henderson and Craig Gilroy, their photographs walking into Laganside Courthouse quickly spread around the internet. Best, along with former Ulster player Rune Pienaar and mixed martial arts champion Liam McCourt, had been asked to appear as character witnesses for Jackson. Calling character witnesses during a trial is unheard of in the Republic, but is permitted in Northern Ireland. It then goes on to outline the, the Ferrari around Best and the Six Nations in the press conference. Then Gallagher writes, The jury was told the following week that Best had been instruction to attend by the defence. In the end, none of the well-known names appeared as witnesses. Instead, Jackson's former Ulster teammate Declan Fitzpatrick, his brother's partner and a family friend, gave evidence of his good character. And finally on this point then, throughout the trial, both the prosecution and defence kept a close eye on both traditional and social media, looking for any commentary which could influence the jury. There were some raised eyebrows when Taoiseach Leo Varadkar briefly alluded to the trial during a radio interview on the issue of abortion in cases of rape. On this occasion, the lawyers decided not to raise it in court. Yeah, that was uh, speaking on Pat Kenny on News Talk. Um, and there's uh, some more detail on that in the Irish Independent as well.